Our next speaker is uh, Dr. David Brown. Uh, uh, David is uh, Associate Professor at the University of Alberta's Department of Economics. Uh, he holds a Canada Research Chair in Energy Economics and Policy and is the President of the Canadian Association for Energy Economics. His research lies in the intersection of energy economics, industrial organization, and regulatory policy. So thank you, David. And please go ahead if you can share your slides. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I actually learned a lot. So I spent my entire life thinking about electricity and Tim told me a lot that I didn't know. So, so I really appreciate it. Um, so, so yeah, today really the, the goal I wanna get out of this talk is to give you a picture of how electricity markets function. And, you know, Tim gave a lot of discussion about how electricity is created effectively. Me as an economist, I just take that for granted. And I say, okay, given the electricity as a potential resource that I can utilize, how do we create a market system to deliver that electricity to you as a customer. So to you as a, as a you know, consumer of electricity. So as many things, we take these you know, complex processes for granted. And, and I wanna give you kind of an overview of how Alberta's electricity market in particular functions. Okay, so let's first, let's start with a view of the product. And, and Tim gave a, some insight into this as well, but our goal is to meet electricity demand. Right, so you know, people want to consume electricity, and we got to make sure that supply equals demand at all times. So that's it's a very complex and difficult task, both from an engineering perspective and an economics perspective. There's there's considerable variation, both from a seasonal perspective, like shown here on the left side of the graph. Um, you know, the winter we get these winter peaks; it gets really cold in in Alberta. Um, and even some summer peaks as well. So air conditioning demand is increasing in the province. In addition to seasonal variation, we have within day variation, right? So at 4 a.m. in the morning on the right-hand side, electricity demand is relatively low. But at you know, 6, 7 p.m. at night, electricity demand peaks and we get this, this high increase in electricity demand. So we have to balance supply and demand at all times. And, and how do we do that? And that, that's the goal of the talk today. Okay, so Tim gave the, the overview here already, but I'll, I'll re-emphasize that we have a lot of different resources, right? So we have electricity generated, and, and this is 2020 numbers, so it's actually a little dated, 50% of gas. So Tim already shows how fast the market's changing. But in 2020, we had about 50% of gas, which is represented by cogeneration, combined cycle, and simple cycle, followed by coal, and these are dispatchable resources. So basically what does that mean is I can call upon them when I want to. And then you got wind and solar, which it comes when it comes, and hydroelectric, which you have a decent amount of control and other is primarily biomass. These resources, and, and Tim showed a graph of Canada, but I wanna zoom in on Alberta. These resources are spread all over the province. So you have a lot of natural gas cogeneration resources up north associated with a lot of industrial processes. You have coal, which is largely compressed around Edmonton and a bit uh, near Red Deer and down towards Calgary, and a lot of natural gas. And then down south, you've got a lot of wind and some growing solar. And the reason why these resources are distributed where they are is because of a lot of real world constraints. So wind is the largest potential on in Southern Alberta as shown here on this graph. Uh, it's just the strongest wind speeds down there. Hydro is located primarily towards the mountains where we have water resources. Cogeneration is located up north where it's associated with a lot of industrial processes. Okay, so at a high level, what I'm trying to show you here is we have these dispersed resources all over the province, right? So the question is, how the heck do we bring all of this together to supply electricity? And that's what I wanna to get to today. So how do we bring these both fuel diversity and location diversity together to supply electricity from an economics perspective? So that, that brings up a few key questions. So, so as I said, we're trying to think about bringing these together. Who operates and coordinates this system? So as you can imagine, it's a pretty darn difficult task to bring all these resources together. How do we pay for these resources, right? So coal costs different than natural gas. 
hydro and wind have different cost profiles. So what is the mechanism, the market framework that we use in Alberta and a lot of jurisdictions to actually pay for these resources? And finally, why do we invest in these things, right? If, if I'm an owner of a facility, what are the economic drivers of investment for me to invest in these generation facilities? Why do I want to invest in a natural gas facility from an economics perspective? All right, so let me give you a really quick history lesson on how electricity markets used to work primarily in these traditional, what we call vertically integrated structures. So each jurisdiction in this graph, so imagine there's three jurisdictions, A, B, and C, they were pretty balkanized. So, you know, in Edmonton, you had a utility that generated electricity and transported it to you and managed the billing and supply. Calgary, you had a utility that generated electricity, transported it to you and managed your bill, et cetera. So historically we had a pretty segmented and, and balkanized grid and it was relatively simple. You know, it wasn't a, simple is not the right word, but it wasn't a super complex industry. Well, in the late nineties, early 2000s, there was a big change in the way the market operated. So there was a restructuring of the market or sometimes called deregulation. And effectively the idea was, you know, maybe it might be cheaper for a electricity generator in area B to supply our power to area A. We may not want area A to only be supplied by area A generators. So basically there was some, there's a, maybe a lower cost generator at a different location. So what they ended up doing at the wholesale side, so the generator side of the market, is they introduced a market mechanism, which basically allowed us to trade across these jurisdictions to maybe lower cost of production. Who does this, right? So this is a very complex system. It used to be primarily maintained with these utilities, these vertically integrated utilities. Now there's an organization called the ISO, so the Alberta Electricity System Operator. Um, if you work in the electricity industry in Alberta, you know, you're going to do a lot of work with the ISO or you're going to work at the ISO itself. So the ISO is in charge of kind of coordinating and managing this system. They're, they're kind of the bumper, you know, the bumper on trying to get this system to orchestrate and work together. So how does this market work? So the, the wholesale markets, is effectively an auction. So the ISO holds an auction for every hour of the day. Generators, so we have a ton of generators, you know, all those dots on the map. Generators submit their bids for each unit that reflect their willingness to supply electricity. And effectively you can think about it as, hey, I'm willing to supply electricity at this price. The ISO takes these bids, stacks them up into something we call the merit order. And then it's effectively supply and demand intersect. So that merit order is the willingness to supply. So it's effectively a supply curve. And where demand, which you know we're really close to real time here. So where demand intersects that curve is effectively where the market clears. So in the middle of the night, we get low prices. So say 10, 20 bucks. In the morning, you get higher prices because demand is higher. We're moving higher up that supply curve. You know, $30, $40 is our electricity price. And then when everyone's coming home and turning on their appliances, where supply intersects demand, we get potentially large prices. And, and on really cold days in Edmonton, or, or in Alberta, I should say, you know, a lot of us are in Edmonton. On really cold days, you're gonna get these potentially really, really high prices because you gotta kick on a relatively more expensive generator. So in essence, this is the workhorse of the electricity market from a market side, is you have this wholesale market, which is an auction, and the supply curve is reflected by bids. And the ISO just clears the market where supply equals demand. So in essence, it's, you know, it's a pretty nice solution to a relatively complex problem. And this is the way that we do the complex dance of supply demand um, for generation. Okay, so how do the economics of this work, right? So this gets more towards the question of why the heck would I do this? If, if I'm a firm, why would I participate in this process? And there's a lot of jargon on this graph because I, I took it from someone, but ignore the jargon. 
Okay, so in the middle of the night, the prices are relatively low and we're not making a lot of money. These, these resources are just breaking even. In the morning, demand is higher and you get a higher uniform price or this price is higher. Well, notice these cheaper resources, say a wind or a gas, a cheap gas unit or a hydro unit, they're in the money now. So they're actually earning a price above their marginal cost of production, which was their bid. Right. So, hey, I'm starting to make some money here. This I'm starting to make some money really drives the economic incentives to be in this market. And then in high demand hours, the price is really high. And notice a lot of people are making money. The price is above my bid, potentially substantially hundreds of dollars. And I could be making a windfall amount of revenues. But it doesn't necessarily mean that when prices are high, they're you know, making crazy money. They use this money to pay for the cost of building these plants, right? These plants are hundreds of millions of dollars. So there's this balance of, yeah, they may be higher. The prices may be higher than my marginal cost, but also I'm using this money in the short term to cover my large fixed cost of investment. So that's effectively in a nutshell, the, the way these markets operate and the economics are primarily, not solely, but primarily driven by the economics they can earn in these hourly auctions. So let me give you a graph, and I, Andrew Leach has it's come up, and I'll call him out again. Thank you, Andrew Leach, for this graph. So the, the merit order curve, this is an example of a merit order curve. Let me just spell out a couple points here. Uh, you end up with really low cost generation, so really low bid generation at $0.00. This tends to be some coal because some coal generators want to make sure they're running a part of their unit to satisfy engineering constraints. Co-generation, which is a byproduct in a lot of circumstances from an industrial process, they're just going to sell their excess heat to make some money. You've got wind down here. You've got imports from neighboring provinces, so British Columbia primarily. Then you start to get to these positive bids. So you start to get to some positive natural gas bids, coal is in here, and then you get really expensive resources. This is hydro generation. So hydro is basically bidding up at the highest price possible because they could turn on, but they don't really want to use this water for generation because they're trying to satisfy other constraints they face, like eco ecological constraints, et cetera. So, so in essence, this is what an example of a merit order curve would look like in Alberta. And as demand varies, so imagine let's hold the curve constant. As demand varies, prices are going to fluctuate. They're going to bounce around this merit order curve. So this is why you actually get a decent amount of volatility in the hourly wholesale price. So this was last year, last winter. You can get prices really close to zero and then potentially prices all the way up to $800 or $900 a megawatt. What's happening is that supply and demand intersection is occurring and that market clearing price is bouncing around based upon that intersection. Now I wanna, I don't have a lot of time, but I do wanna really emphasize that you don't necessarily see this volatility, right? So you're gonna see an article in the Edmonton Journal that says prices were $1,000 per megawatt hour last night. And you know, I grimace a little bit. I'm like, yes, we do pay it at the end of the day, but our bills are smoothed. And I, I wanna make sure you get this takeaway from this conversation. There's a retail side of the market, which we won't get too into the weeds, and I laughed at this picture, but there's a resale, retail side of this market that manages this variability. So retailers effectively offer an insurance to stabilize our bills, right? So you go on a utilities website, say you go on Epcor's website, they'll offer you a one-year fixed price plan. Effectively, the retailer is absorbing the volatility that they face in this wholesale market because we don't, most consumers don't want to see this volatility. They absorb that variability. They do pass the costs kind of on an average basis down to us, but we don't observe that extreme volatility in prices. At the end of the day, we're charged for the underlying cost of the resources. We're also technically charged for the insurance they're providing to shield us from this volatility. But it is important to recognize that there is a middle step between these prices and the bills that we see for, we see for electricity. So with my last minute here, I want to kind of just highlight some challenges that we're going to face, so that we're already facing. Alberta has something called an energy-only market design, and 
This market design, what that means basically is the primary revenues that we receive as firms, imagine I'm a firm, is coming from this wholesale market. There's nothing else out there. There's no other primary mechanism out there that gives me money to incentivize me to build a power plant. Those incentives are primarily through that auction. Well, there's big growing debates over the sustainability of a market design like that. So what do I mean? Well, as we get more wind and solar, well, those units bid in at zero dollars. They are effectively, their variable cost is close to zero, if not zero. That suppresses average prices for resources such as natural gas, which as others have alluded to, is a potentially valuable stabilizing resource. Those lower average prices kind of damage the economics a little bit of these natural gas resources. So there's some concerns that maybe these energy only market designs like we have in Alberta, and this gets a little in the weeds, but it's important, may not be sustainable from an economics perspective. I would disagree with that statement, but this is an ongoing debate in, in the economics of how these markets function. On the graph here, I provide a, an example of kind of an ISO, future long kind of trajectory of the portfolio and the investment. In the near term, there is an investment growth in coal to gas conversions and natural gas. But looking forward, this is their clean tech scenario, which I actually view as more realistic than their baseline, it is a pretty darn heavy emphasis on wind and solar resources. The future outcomes are really going to depend upon a lot of things, though, right? So this is just a scenario. It's going to depend upon the stringency and the nature of a, the environmental policies in the province, global oil and gas demand, which is going to really drive demand for electricity and provision of cogeneration and technology innovation. And then the ISO, they have some really great people working there that are implementing really important policies. And those policies are going to affect the way these markets operate. Okay, so I'll end there, but I hope you have a better understanding now of roughly how these markets operate from an economics perspective. Thank you.